Here we go. Lower... Okay. I'm going to um, sign out and sign back in again, see if they'll be enabled. What is she trying to get enabled? Oh, virtual background, here we go. Yeah. Well, I've got the mute, but I don't have anything else. I mean, I've got the other one. Uh, same, same for me. I shut off my uh, virtual backgrounds. Probably with one of the updates. Well, isn't that the uh, virtual background behind you, Will? Um, yeah, actually it does, but uh, for some reason it told me that my virtual background was turned off, although it's working. It's my like video filters are turned Where off. I can turn it back on. Yeah, all I get a choice of is the blur. I don't have the others. Maybe you have to sign back into um, you know, Zoom or something. When I went to meeting settings, I got all the settings and it's way down at the bottom. Um, but mine was all on, but I'm still not getting filtered. It still shows I'm the computer. Exactly phone. with me too. Yeah. It was on, and I turned it off and back on and that didn't make any difference. And mine oh, says Jim, oh, Jim I liked your other one. That was as cute as could be. <laughs> um, when I go in, it says filters have been disabled. To enable, go to meeting settings. <laughs> oh, that's okay, cute. I appear to be in meeting settings. Gonna go grab my coffee. <laughs> Get a big cup. <laughs> Maybe oh, that's video. a cute one. Oh, what happened? Okay. I, I don't think this is vital for our for the rest of our meeting, and we have oh. a long presentation, so. Oh, okay. We, we were just playing. Can we table this discussion? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Don't seem to be getting bumped off now. So we are recording oh, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, you are. Okay. It will record everything, including the presentation. My problem is. <coughs> <coughs> I lost my word. I can't quite seem to get my tab bar hidden. It does not disappear. Wait a minute. Now it did. <laughs> All right. Let's see whether I still have my yes, I do. Now I'm going to mute everybody for the presentation. And now I'm going to try to start. There we go. You're all up there. And now I need to get rid of these little blank spots.
I think that'll do it. And to start the presentation. Whoops. I don't hear any sound. Hi, this is Art, and I'm going to start off with my desktop. This is going to be a talk about a lot of vacation pictures and other pictures, and I appreciated Jerry's pictures. I, I appreciated John Kraut's pictures of the uh, geocaching. A lot of vacation pictures. You're going to see some of those again from my perspective here. Um, this demonstration actually follows a shorter presentation I gave last month to our UChug user group. And then Judy asked me if I could present a few examples of how to use GIMP to modify photos. I'll go ahead and start my my slide deck here now. So we're going to go to a program called GIMP, the new Im image manipulation program. And I've been using photo editing programs for over 20 years, and I continue to edit pictures for my personal pleasure and for our user group's newsletter. Now, if you've been around picture or image editing for a while, you're familiar with Adobe Photoshop. It's a professional grade editing tool, once available pretty easily, but now it's a pretty costly option. And then long ago, I started using the shareware version of Paint Shop Pro, which is no longer available. It was purchased by Corral in 2011. So GIMP was the first was the program I found in 2014 with the power and tools similar to Paint Shop Pro. It's free and available to both Windows and Linux and meets all of my needs. Why do we edit photos? Well, there are a lot of simple editing photos editing features available in, in Google Paint and Microsoft Paint and many other tools, filters that rotate. Sometimes you can edit a photo before downloading from uh, uh, your, your camera, and uh, then you may want to do some additional editing. But why more editing? Well, perhaps you want to remove the beer can in the background or some other distraction, or you forgot the flash. Google Photos actually are a good starting point for that. But you may need to add more contrast or brighten, and you can do that with GIMP. You can add text, backgrounds, people, even, well, create a whole new imaginary world in your mind. Where do I use these photo image, these photos I've I've manipulated? Well, I'll show you some of my personal photos that I've created for use at home newsletter, social media, and even a headshot for a national Zoom webinar. Almost all editing programs have several of these tools, plus many more. Programs like Microsoft Paint, MyPaint, Pixlr, Photoscape, Arifan View, Darktable, all easily available. Some do not have all the professional tools found in GIMP, and some have others that uh, are not found here. Most have the basic tools to erase and draw directly on a picture, make structural changes like cropping and rotating. Other tools can make changes to brightness, color, other effects. And then professional tools add features like layers and transparencies, which will be something we'll be talking a lot about today. I'll demonstrate most of these tools today, but many more exist, and uh, I'll have some suggestions for some tutorials on how to use those at the end of the presentation. Okay, some examples of photos. Well, 
This is a picture from an old photo family photo album. Maybe it needs some help. So you post it on so you can post it on your uh, social media account, like a throwback Thursday photo of mom from decades gone by. Maybe a vacation trip to Silverton, Colorado is the earliest photo in the old album you can find of yourself and your grandparents, and the only one I ever saw with my granddad smiling from 1949. I was 10 months old. A late evening walk at my cousin's house in Colorado. You saw this as my wallpaper. A soothing vacation memory now greets me each time I sit down to my computer. Another vacation trip across the country to a real live train museum with restored rail cars, a round table, steam and diesel locomotives. Start the memory making machine recording and with your grandchild in tow, well, that first walk hand in hand, a historic place that you'll never forget Every detail firmly imprinted forever. Just picture that. Well, that photo could even lead to an award. Would you would you imagine winning an award for a photograph and be given a real certificate from an international organization like the APCUG and by another award winner himself? Well, that little girl started growing up, dressing up. That is my princess in the castle foyer. Uh, vacation trips in front of famous places will certainly get into the family album. Start the music to uh, Someday My Prince Will Come, believe it or not. Maybe all you need is a simple headshot photo for that unexpected presentation you get called on to do. Well, this is what started it all. A trip to the beach after months of meeting with only on Zoom, made even better with cake and the people you haven't been with for 15 months, celebrating our user group's 42nd anniversary. And it was nice to have Jim, the first UCHUG president from 1978, sitting right up front, and Greg, our current president, in the back row with a wide brim bill, wide brimmed hat, and even the editor on the far right, uh, in the photo, I mean, not politically. The problem, well, none of these photos escaped untouched, except, well, that one. What changed? From a little to a lot. Time for a reality check. We'll look at the originals before we jump into GIMP and see how it's done. Reality? Well, it was a couple of precious photos from uh, my family's uh, album, but black and white photos are so blah by today's standards. And a two inch high photo of your mom, rest in peace, really needed that pop of color. And yes, she confirmed that was the correct color. As to the one horse sleigh, now I can only wish I remembered it, but with a little imagination and that big smile, it becomes a memory. Two photos on the left, just before sunset. Notice the bright light, the sun shining across the road. The second photo, several feet down the road and a couple minutes later after the sun is down. But together, they make a great wallpaper. Sometimes, you have a chance to get that one-time photo, even if it is in the hallway at home, and she's if she's been patient with you and lets you take the photo, take it. Worry about the background later. Now, time passes quickly. An Easter photo is worth a million words, and those braces were so worth it. But posing with me was just part of the fun. Someday her prince will come. And in a blink, and two boyfriends later, that's two friends who are boys, despite the prom and the homecoming, but just friends. So you take a photo when he drops by the house after some event. He's looking mighty good. 
you get another one of those in the hall photos, knowing someday he will make it into the picture somewhere far, far away. The headshot was pretty easy, just a crop to the handsome guy on the left. Uh, the handsome guy on the right was down to see us from Salt Lake City. And then a couple of minutes making that arm disappear into the foliage. Well, here's the photo that started this problem because Greg, the president, took the photo. He was not in it. Thought we had a second shot of him when he handed the photo handed the camera off, but uh, no, uh, operator error. I waved my wedge, magic wand to put him in the photo for the newsletter and on our website, not an unusual activity for me. And then it became a short topic for our next monthly meeting. Uh, local member topics are always needed when we can when we cannot get a Speakers Bureau presentation. And because I opened my mouth and volunteered at our board meeting. So in that next Zoom meeting, a friendly lady from the APCUG saw my presentation and asked me to talk about it at the next VTC. And here I am. Nobody says no to Judy. Uh, just kidding. So Greg and Jim from the Wayback Machine stepped up to provide the needed guy in back to stand behind his user group as he has for many years. All I had to do was some GIMP magic. Now, one more. Everything isn't about editing photos. Each month is a production of the newsletter. Each month, new topics. And to pique interest, my friend Hoodie takes a look under the hood to see what we'll be up to. One month, it was a discussion of solid state drives. Last month, Hoodie, as always, wearing his mask, saw we were discussing photo magic. How did the president get in that picture? Some YouTube information of interest and members helping members. Note that in addition to the friends climbing into the hood, that magic wand casts a shadow on the computer case. But memories are made of this. What you see is what was real. While her mom gave us some space, we bonded. The real memories were not about the things around us, but the future before us. That little girl has graduated high school, is working, starting college this fall, actually this Monday. Everything else is just window dressing. But where did all those all, all other authentic looking parts of the photo come from? Answer, well, around the world train stations out west and far away places, manipulated, arranged, and shaped. Photos like these. Each one a piece of the photo. To match the feeling in the mind, the how involves a, a good tool like GIMP. So now I'm gonna give you some, uh, uh, from those photos, uh, how they were placed together. The trick is using transparency and layers. We'll look at the uh, princess and the road. We'll look at the missing man with the, the prince and the president. Uh, give my right, right arm for the perfect headshot. It was pretty simple. And some of the tools used in making that winning photo. So now I need to ship over to my uh, GIMP application. So there's GIMP on my desktop. I'll give it a start. What we're gonna start with is the photo of the bike on the road. So I'm going, I already have the files saved as projects. So I'm going to reopen that project. In reality, one would normally import a photo and start editing it, but we're going to get a head start on it by starting off with the photos already loaded. Now here is the original photo. Now then just to kind of help orient you a little bit on the screen, up in the top left are tools and some information 
such as the photo that we're looking at. On the right is information about an individual tool, its size, its shape, its aspect ratio, other features unique to that particular tool. And down along the bottom right corner here, you'll see a series of salt, small thumbnails. These are the thumbnails of the individual layers of photos that I'm gonna be working with. The first thing we need to do is look at our two photos. So there's the first one, there's the second one. And as you can see, they don't quite match up. Our job is going to be to make them match better. I'm gonna begin because I already know where this needs to go by putting this photo somewhere off to the left side in order to bring the other photo in to this workspace. I'm gonna take that photo and what we're gonna do is we're gonna match up the horizon so that we're in the ballpark with the two photos. So there you can see the two photos line up, but there's a problem in the middle and we need to make that road look like it didn't get chopped and the sky needs to be matched up because the time difference, the sky looks different. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin by erasing parts of this picture with the, uh, the mailbox in it. And I'm going to take and erase some of it so that the, the road behind it shows through. And I, oops, got to get on the right picture here. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, now that's the eraser tool, but you notice there's a problem. The road's not showing through. The reason is I don't have transparency turned on on this layer. So I'm going to undo those changes, Control-Z, and I'm going to, on this photo, I'm going to turn on a feature called transparency. I go down to the transparency menu and I'm gonna add what's called an alpha channel. With the alpha channel turned on now, when I erase the photo behind it begins to show through. And I'll demonstrate that by turning off the original photo here. And you can see that I have got the eraser taking out the, the part of the road that's going to be replaced with the long, road into the into the sunset there. So that's how you you do that so that you get the, sh the road shining through. Now obviously you need to be careful in how much you erase because if you erase too much you've got to go back and undo. I'm going to jump forward to where I have actually erased these two photos into a, a correct pattern. I'm going to show you first of all the road. First of all in order to make the sky match up, I had to add some picture because getting the horizons to align left me some missing photo up here at the top. So what I did was I just copied a lot of this sky up here to make it match. And I also added a little bit of roadway down to the bottom to complete the picture that was going to be needed there. The other photo, I erased most of the road and I have taken the sky and kind of smeared it, kind of smudged it so that when the two of them overlay each other, those two colors will match up. I also added a little bit of a fake road down here that I manufactured out of the existing weeds and grass and added to the bottom of the picture. So that when we add the two pictures together, we have one complete photo with a, uh, a very nicely matched up sky. Now the way to match that sky up is using another one of the tools and I'm going to go up here to use a tool called the smudge tool. So using the smudge tool, I can take pieces of the picture and just like you would on wet paint, and I'm going to make an, uh, a, 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 a smear that doesn't really work good for this picture, but to show the effect, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to hold down the control key and the scroll wheel so that I can zoom in. And I'm going to smudge, oops, gotta get on the right layer. I can just smudge that grass out and make it extend to where I want it to. And that way in the 
when I put the two layers together, we now have an inappropriate smudge of the, the grass. I did the same thing on the sky up at the top where I just took the sky and smudged it over and layered it on top of the other photo, which I also took some of its colors from the other side and, and brought them together. So it's just a matter of, of almost painting like an artist would with, uh, with wet paints to create the, uh, the color density from each side into the, um, into the photo. Now you'll notice over in my, in my layers, this middle layer, I've got a, a layer of red. I'll show you what I use that for. Oftentimes it's difficult to see what you've actually smudged or what, where boundaries on photos are. So with the a, a, a co contrasting color, it makes it much easier to find where to erase, what you've smudged and, and uh, so forth. So I use this technique uh, almost always when I'm doing a, a two photo overlay. Now I'm gonna go to another photo, the photo of the, of the girl in the, um, in the hallway and let me find her on here. So here's the girl in the hallway, again, holding down the control key and the, the wheel, scroll wheel to zoom in. You can see that this is just the hallway, not quite the background that we, you'd want for a nice little picture like this. So first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm going to turn on the, um, the transparency for this, this layer. Uh, let's see, it looks like, a, looks like I've already got transparency turned on. Okay, so go to my eraser tool and I begin erasing. Uh, let me get, get on the right, get on the right layer. Get on the right layer here. No, no, not that layer. Uh, why is my eraser tool not working? Well, for some reason my eraser, oh, not on the right layer. There we go. Oh, got to turn the, the uh, transparency on. There we go. Okay, now turning on the transparency. Doing this kind of picture is very time consuming because you want to erase just as close as you can to the subject of interest. So you get the, most, the bulk of it erased and then you reduce the size of your tool, in this case the, the eraser tool, so that you can go in and go very precisely around everything that you want to do and you can get down to a very small level where you uh, can be very accurate with what you're doing. The better accuracy you get at removing the unwanted background, the better the final product will be. So you erase what is undesired and when you put a layer behind it, it will show up as if the person was standing in front of that layer. Now, you just continue that process over and over and over again until you have gotten a picture all the way down to that. So here's the final product. And I'm going to zoom in just a moment on something specific. Notice that the hair looks a little bit, well, fuzzy, uh, out of focus. And that's a technique used to make the, the picture actually look better because in reality, the, the uh, erasing could have made it look very uh, a very hard border and that hard border would look like a sticker stuck on front of a picture. But this, when combined with a background, makes the presentation look as if the person was really in, in, the, in the room. Now, one other technique that I use to make the person have presence, notice it looks like she's actually got a shadow in the room well, that shadow wasn't in the original picture. If we turn it, turn that, that off, you'll see how the layer has her shadow right there. That's, that is, was done with a tool called the, um, uh, uh, so, uh, find the right one here. Uh, where is that? Dodge and burn. So I'm gonna use the dodge tool I'm sorry, the burn tool to burn in the image 
Uh, I need to make increase the size. And get on the right layer. Oops, I'm on, looks like I'm on, I'm on dodge. So I need to go to burn. So I need to burn. See how I, how I can make that darker. Making it appear that she has a shadow. I could even put a shadow on the other side, making it looks like she had a little bit of cross lighting. So this is a technique to give presence to the individual to make it look as if they were really there when, of course, they were not. Next photo we're going to look at is that photo with the uh, the the uh, prince and her and the princess. We're going to go to the photos that make up that photo. Here's the guy in the hallway without any editing done on him. Again, we're going to use the same technique. We're going to turn on the transparency and erase everything around him that does not belong, specifically all of the, the white. Now, there are several tools, as anyone who's used GIMP might point out, that I could have done this with. There's a couple other tools that will you can uh, select by color and erase by color. But for simplicity, we're just going to keep uh, to just use a, a basic erasing tool. And after you've erased everything that you don't want from him, you wind up with just the guy. Now, I've done some other editing uh, around him here that you'll see in just a minute was necessary to add context to the, the uh, young lady after the uh, man on her right has been erased. And she winds up with just her. And I had to add a little bit of length to her legs in order to make it fit the picture. And when you put the two of them together, you've got her standing right beside him. Now, there was some resizing that had to be done in order to make the two pictures in, in scale to each other. And of course, sometimes you, you have to move them around in order to make them be in the correct position. But once you've got them in the correct position, then all you have to do is, is add a, a background. And there they are together. So again, it was just editing, uh, erasing away the parts of the picture you don't want and finding a photo that will match the, the sunlight, the shading, and so forth of the photo that you want to create. Next one we're going to look at is a very simple photo. The, the headshot was a simple photo taken a couple weeks ago, myself and my son. I thought it would make a pretty good headshot, but I really don't want his arm in the picture. That's really not necessary for what I'm wanting to do. So zooming in just a little bit, what we're going to do is we're going to use a different tool. It's called the clone tool. And the clone is simply used to, to make a copy of a piece of uh, the picture that you want to make somewhere else. Let me show you uh, an, an extreme example of it. I'm holding down the control key and I'm clicking on that part of the screen right there, which is going to leave a little circle. It may be hard for you to see on your screens. It's a pretty small set of dots around that spot. But if I come down here and do like this, you can see that I can add whatever I want to in another location. That's cloning. And control Z to undo that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that picture, that piece of the, uh, the, the, uh, the background, and I'm going to put it in to my, my picture. And I'm going to take some of the t-shirt and I'm going to wipe out the t-shirt, wipe out the hand on the t-shirt. And then we just do that until we get all the pieces that we want edited, doing the same thing over here, taking the background, erasing the background where we don't want it to where we want its shoulder. And eventually you wind up with a picture that looks something like this. where the background is gone and 
you can also do things like smudging the edges to make the the edge in the final photograph disappear uh, against the background. So there's the edited photo. Now then, the next photo we're going to do is we're going to be putting somebody in that wasn't there. This is going to be a case of the missing president. Here is a photo. It's already had a couple little minor retouches done to it. Uh, notably, I changed the color of the icing on the on the cake to match the color of our uh, our, our corporate colors, if you will. You see the T-shirts that we're, several of us are wearing in what has become kind of our corporate color. But we're missing a key individual in the back here. The first trick in replacing a making a photo like this is finding a suitable subject to set in there. Obviously, in this photo. We've got full length bodies, so you need somebody with head and shoulders, legs, waist, feet, and everything. That was a challenge for this particular photo, and I couldn't really find a good one. The best photo I could find was, um, let's see, was a photo of Greg at a uh, picnic that we had in 2014. Now, this is pretty much what he looks like, so it is well representative of him, but we're missing the legs. So what I did was I pasted that photo into our desired location, and you can see there's an obvious problem there. Well, we don't want all of that. So once again, we go to the eraser tool and erase the parts of the photo we don't want. So I've got the, I can see that I've got the transparency already turned on on this layer. And you can see that what I did was I just erased all those uh, trees and everything behind him out of the photo and including our former president. And eventually I wind up with a photo that has just Greg peeking over the shoulders of the other guys. So I'll fast forward just a little bit here to turn on a layer that has Greg. And there you'll see Greg has all been trimmed out. Now then, the reality is I made most of Greg disappear. If you look at, the, at, at what I actually wound up with, there is all that was left of Greg after doing all of the editing. Just a little view of him between a couple body parts In the, in the slot there and his head and shoulders. Now, the other problem I had was that I didn't have photo of the pants, so I took it from another photo. I added his pants in by doing the same technique. Again, that's just a little tiny piece of, of photo. Everything erased except what I don't want. And you've got the president, oops, turn the right one on. Uh, there we go. So you've got Greg in the photo where he never really was because he was behind the camera. That's the technique that's used for the, the uh, replacing the missing person photo. Now then, my last subject is looking at the uh, railway photo. This is the photo that uh, I submitted to the APCUG for the photo contest, and it is much more complicated, much more complex than the other photos have we've seen so far. This was the original photograph. The building on the right and the Pullman cars on the right are the only thing that will remain eventually of the final photo. But taking inspiration from the empty chair setting all along the warehouse building, I was able to, to find photographs of different railway stations. And I actually found one with someone sitting in the chair, if you will. So uh, the first thing though that I did was to isolate on the key subjects. The key subjects being the guy walking, oops, and the background uh, buildings. Now, first thing I did 
for myself was I got rid of that ugly camera strap going across my back. Again, this was done using the clone feature and that I demonstrated just a moment ago. Just cloned the shirt in and made that a little bit more presentable. The other thing that I did do was I darkened the shadow because on the final photo, it needed a little bit more uh, boldness to see the shadow. The other thing that I did was I, I isolate, and I'm going to turn everything else off now. So there you have just the, the key individuals walking down an invisible building. I also isolated the uh, Pullman car and the railroad and the building on the, the right. I'm going to take those out for just a moment, though. We'll, we'll see them appear at, in the final photo. The next photo that I added was a railway station to provide some context for where we are. Well, it already looks a lot better. Uh, oddly, well, not surprisingly, the railroad is in exactly the right position. Not a surprise since, well, pretty much all railway, railway stations like this are going to be built the same way. The railway along the side and a uh, walking corridor. And this one's got a nice canopy over the top, but it's got a sign in a language that isn't exactly uh, the language that I would have used. So we've got a lot of work to do. First work, I, first thing that we're going to add is some better sidewalk. So I'm going to add a little bit of, of uh, flagstones to the sidewalk. This was from one photograph. And then I took that particular chunk of flagstone, made a duplicate copy of it, changed the perspective of it, shifted it, and did a little editing to it to create the same piece of sidewalk on the other side. So those are both one and the same original piece of sidewalk with just a little bit more photo magic added to them. Next, let's do something about that sign. So uh, a genuine, uh, from some museum somewhere, photo of a Santa Fe uh, uh, piece of uh, tile work, uh, that does a good job of replacing there. Then down at the far end of the track, we've got the platform number. Here from an old Western station somewhere is platform number one. Next, we add some building pieces. Now these two building pieces are from one same photo. I'm gonna isolate on it for just a moment to show you that photo a little bit closer. You can see that the photo has the elements there, but part of it is cut away because we have a chair from the other photo. So in order to make the layers work correctly, you have to erase some pieces of other photos in order to get the pieces to match up. So there you have, oops, there you have the same three windows duplicated in order to make the final photo. Then we need to add some interest behind us here. We'll put a warehouse doorway on the left. And from another photo, some more brick wall. So now we're just about there. Let's turn on the rest of our sidewalk. All that's left at this point is to add our original buildings in. And now you've got a memory worth keeping that never existed. So those are the basic tools that I used for those uh, photos. A couple of tools that I didn't uh, just uh, show you great great detail was photos uh, features like uh, changing the size of a layer, changing the uh, perspective where I changed the actual angle of the of the sidewalk to make a, a uh, uh, match to the desired railway station. Uh, but there are a whole lot of tools up there. Each tool has its descriptor, size, other features. Uh, for example, the, uh, let me find one that really changed it there. There you can see quite a bit different set of features to do the editing for the uh, uh, scissors tool the paintbrush tool, 
the the paint tool um all of those tools you select from either there or you can select from the menu or you can also select them by right clicking on the the uh, uh the surface and edit the uh pick pick the tool and edit it directly so three different ways to edit uh, three different ways to pick and, and fix tools. Uh, pretty typical of most Windows software where you have three ways to get something. Also, a lot of the tools have uh, keyboard shortcuts, which I usually forget which ones do what. And so I have to always go back and look at the menu to remember what the, uh, the tool uh, shortcut is. So that is, that is the essence of my photo editing. All right, you got ten minutes left. Yes, I've got, I, and I'm, I've got just a little bit of text, and then I will have some room for some questions. Fantastic. So, there you've seen the six options that are uh, the six different e photos that I've edited. Uh, I know that I've gone over that awfully quickly. GIMP is a pretty sophisticated tool, and it has taken me several years to to learn all of those techniques, but there are a number of good uh, demo demonstration programs, tutorials that uh, the GIMP organization itself has. The GIMP org's tutorials are actually quite good for starters. A search with Google or DuckDuckGo or in YouTube for GIMP primer or GIMP tutorial are both very lucrative searches because uh, a lot of these things are best seen in a watch me do it sort of a, uh, a method. Uh, the, particularly the, uh, the, the YouTubes have, have got a lot of stuff. One of the good uh, sources I found was this one called on opensource.com, Tricks for GIMP Beginners. It's really quite good. Now, as a bonus and emphasizing and trading off on the concept of layers. I just recently discovered this, how to edit a PDF. If you've ever gotten a, a PDF that you really wanted to put, say, sign your signature on, or you had a, a PDF that you didn't have the source of, but you need to edit to show to someone else, and you wanted to change some words, fill in some blanks, or that sort of thing that you, you didn't have the original uh, text, you can import a PDF into GIMP. It imports as multiple layers. So if you have a 23 page PDF, you wind up with 23 pages. But as I've shown you, all you have to do is uh, isolate on just one, go in with, for example, the text tool, write or erase or do whatever you want to, and then save the file back out as a PDF. Now, speaking of saving files, the one thing that I didn't demonstrate, but it's quite simple, is how after you've done all this editing, do you save the work? Well, first is saving the work with all the layers in the GIMP format. If you just do a save and name the file, it'll save as an XCF file, and that's the GIMP image file that I've been editing on. But of course, you probably want to put that file, that picture, on say your Facebook page or a web page or in a in a printed document or maybe put it into a PDF even. You save that file in any one of the, the many image photo uh, image formats that are available. I usually use the JPEG format because it compresses them and I can control the compression and so forth. You can also save as a PNG or any one of about 16 other formats that are that are uh, common to just about any any image editing program um, so if if you're concerned about well you you have a photo from somebody but it's in a different format you can go ahead and open that file and then you can save it as that file or save it back as a different type of file after saving of course your edits i think that's about all i have I'm going to open it up because I know that there's probably a lot of questions because I did skim over some of this stuff very rapidly, but I wanted to give you a, a, a big view from the top of how, how from simple to very complex, you can do photo editing with GIMP. 
and I'll open it up to our moderator there for any questions. Thank you very much, Art. Uh, I didn't get a chance to introduce you properly, but Art <laughs> is, the fact, is the editor for he's the editor for under the hood under the computer hood user group. Yeah. And uh, I, I I enjoyed your presentation. I'm not one to do uh, that kind of stuff, but I learned something. So yeah, you have uh, about. 89 people watching and a lot of questions. And we'll try I'm to sure. Of them, okay. Go ahead. Uh, how do you find GIMP software? Well, how do you find GIMP software is right there at the GIMP.org address. All right. And it What's is they, public. It's public software. It's free. So, it, and it works on Linux and uh, uh, Windows 10, Windows 11, anything. All right. What capabilities does GIMP offer uh, that Photoshop doesn't have? Well, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because I have avoided Photoshop uh, somewhat like a plague, but I know that there are tools that in Photoshop are different than GIMP. Uh, I have seen a couple of photos being edited at some uh, professional studios where I had some photos taken. They brought the photo up in, in Photoshop. They did some manipulation and I thought, wow, that's pretty neat. But to, to give you an honest comparison of the two, I can't do that. I'm sure that if you did a search on compare GIMP to Photoshop, uh, that uh, Google or DuckDuckGo or YouTube would probably be your friend. Fantastic. I like that answer. Now, back at uh, 33 minutes after the hour, somebody said, I do not understand the order of layers. Ah, good, good question. Excellent question. And I'll go ahead and I'm going to open the GIMP photo back up again. And uh, I'm going to go back to maybe a simpler photo here. Let me, let me select, um, let me select uh, the, uh, I'm going, I'm going to do the, uh, the, the, the princess and the prince and the princess here. Right now I've got no photos showing. Over on the right are my my uh, thumbnails of those photos. I'm going to bring up the very first one right there. There's the young man. He's the second from the bottom layer, as you see here. I'm going to take this layer that's called, well, it's just called layer, and I'm going to drag it up to here, make it visible. And you'll see now that the layer underneath of it is not visible. If I redrag and put it back in the other order, you can see now that the red layer is below the photo of the man. This photo here is on top of those two. So here you can see, and I'm going to just drag it around and move it around so you can see. You can see that in layers, in terms of layers, red and then the young man, and then the two people are the three layers that are stacked on top of each other. Depending on how you arrange them, what you make invisible, what you erase, depends, uh, affects how you are going to compose this photo. There actually is another tool for doing the same sort of thing with layers where you actually do almost exactly the opposite, where you let a piece of a photo show through a mask. There, there's a, a layers mask that I've not become proficient in, so I didn't demonstrate it, but it amounts to the same thing where one layer lays beneath another layer and a, a piece of some picture shows through on the desired layer. So those are layers. They're draggable. You can move them up and down. And in fact, uh, if we look at the photo with the, uh, with the court steps, if I take and drag the photo with grandpa up on there, you can see now the two of them are standing, well, sort of, in front of the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court building. So layers are just like they were in the, back in high school when you had the overhead projector and you had that layer, that map that had the uh, US uh, outline and the history teacher laid over it a layer that showed the, uh, the, the uh, different state boundaries, and then another layer that showed the uh, Louisiana Purchase and all those things, and they were just layers stacked on top of each other. So that's layers. All right. Now, uh, another important question, I think, is, is there a manual for GIMP? 
Yes, it's an online manual, and it's uh, it, when normally when you install GIMP, it will not automatically download that that manual to your computer. You can download it separately, or while running GIMP, you can go to the uh, F1 key, and and it will bring up the help menu, and you can. And it's going to take it a little while to come up here because I, I don't I don't often run with it running, but. Uh, and I'm, I'm not having luck getting it to come up and show. But yes, uh, the manual is quite extensive. Uh, it's, it's a pretty well-written manual, although sometimes you almost have to know a little bit about GIMP in order to uh, uh, know the terms to go look at, and it's taken a little while to, to, to get it up here because I normally don't have it running. So you can download it, so it'll be instantly available, or if you don't download it, it's available online anytime. Okay, fantastic answer. Is there a way to remove reflection on glass? <sighs> well, if the original photo had that reflection that you don't desire, there are uh, a couple things that you can do, depending on what you're trying to make show up on that piece of glass. If it's just a simple flat color, you can use the clone tool to clone the uh, surroundings from the glass into that area. The other thing that you might be able to do, particularly if that reflection is a reflection of something uh, in the background, you can use the uh, the, the dodge and burn tool. You can, for example, you could make a image that's being reflected on glass more visible by by burning it to, to make it more more pronounced or you can dodge it to make it less pronounced and then copy uh clone onto that surface some of the the uh surrounding desirable color as far as being able to remove the reflection it's part of the picture so you're going to have to do something uh more like you know painting creating that image in the place that you want to remove the reflection. But small reflections, if it's just like a reflection on the edge, uh, say a, a little little highlight reflection up at the top of a, uh, of a photo frame, and you're just kind of wanting to make it uh, kind of disappear a little bit, oftentimes just dodging it will, will darken it enough that it's not noticeable. Okay, again, uh, Art, you got a lot of questions and I'm trying to pick uh, one. I understand that you can get an answer to but we're going to send you all the rest of them and you're going to have a chance to answer many of them Good. um next one how do you colorize the old black and white photos well gosh i was hoping nobody would ask me that <laughs> um <laughs> the the two photos that i showed in my presentation uh and let me go back to uh the tutorial and and uh, see if i can scroll back to that real quickly here and i'll i'll, I'll just tell you what I did, uh, where, where are they at? There they are. This photo here, and uh, is that showing up well enough for everybody? I don't need to go full screen, I don't think, with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the photo was um, just a simple black and white photo, obviously, and I used the paint tool and a high level of opacity, op opaqueness, op uh, of transparency of the painting. I, I picked the paint color that I wanted, and I'm going to go back over to Windows or to the GIMP here. Up in the top left here, you'll see the color, and you can you can pick the color. So, for example, for my mother's photo, I picked a color probably somewhere up in that range there, something very very light, and then using the paint tool and see if I can see if I can do this on the fly here. And I'm going to change, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the, the uh, paint tools opacity to something very thin, about 41%. And I'm going to do some painting on here. So I'm painting blue onto that photo. Now, you have to do this very carefully and, and with many iterations and trying to, to come up with the right layer of stuff. But you can, you can paint directly onto a photo with with the transparency turned on so that it's not like painting with a hard paintbrush. You can see that it's it's just a matter of trial and error, but I did that on that other photo. Now, the photo of grandma and grandpa, 
which is the next one, I actually created four different layers for this. And I did that same process, but putting each color on its own layer. So for example, there is a layer of dark blue that I used, that I applied over the, the what I assumed to probably have been blue jeans. I used a layer of what I called dark red on the, the red wagon. Who knows what color the real wagon was? I used my imagination. I used a very light, very, very light pink color for the faces and just adding it very sparingly. And then of course I added some green on a green layer and some dark green for the dark green trees in the background. So it's it's about, it's a, another photograph, but it's about six layers deep with each layer being a separate color. So that's how I did that photo. Now, be honest, there are probably some other tools out on the internet for colorizing photos that are more elegant than this. I was just having fun with this and I thought, hey, grandma and grandpa, I'd like to, to colorize that. It was just for my own purpose and probably not the best job of colorizing that has ever been done. Alrighty. Um, lots of questions about how to do specific things. Sure. But I want to go back to a general question that we had. Is there copyright concerns? because you're using some other photos to you yeah you have you have to be careful where you're getting photos and how you're using them uh most of those photos are well several photos were from museums which are typically not copyrighted uh there are two of the photos uh that were uh from oh gosh i can't remember the name of the uh uh can't remember the name of the source but i had to pay i think five dollars for the two photos so uh there that is a potential Oftentimes, the photos that you'll be using, though, for your particularly for a uh, family photo, are going to be your own photos. So, of course, there's no copyright on problems on those. But if you're doing something, uh, you're not taking a photo from a public source or from uh, uh, Commons. Uh, yeah, you you do need. Well, the other thing is, if you're producing this photo for uh, publication for for pay, uh, putting it out there somewhere where it's going to get that kind of exposure, you definitely do. For most of my photos, I'm using them for my own personal use and uh, don't have any problem with that because uh, they're on my own. They're in my photo albums that I've created. Okay. I got a final question for you, and the question is from me. Okay. Uh, how long have you been using GIMP, and did you find it difficult to become proficient? Well, I've been using it since 2014. Uh, is it difficult? Uh, yes, like anything new, it is difficult. It is much easier if you use some tutorials and you watch somebody else do it because sometimes just the very idea of, oh, I have to go over here and click on a tool or I have to right click on something to get a menu up. Those are the tricks uh, that are common with any software, but a lot of the tutorials, uh, because they are show and tell type of things, you see them clicking on that thing and see it happening, it begins to make sense to you. Fantastic answer. I like that one too. There he is. Here, we're back. Hey. I'm going to ask Will Wakely to unmute himself. And I think Will is our... My pleasure to introduce Chris and Jim Gold. Whoops. Geeks on tour that love to teach. Hold on. Chris and Jim lived and worked and played scuba diving mostly in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for many years. And I need to turn that off. <laughs> I think Will Wakely is our resident photo guru. Not true. Uh, have Will's reaction to that presentation. I am. You have the information wrong. I am not the photo expert. I don't know who is. Maybe Saul, but I don't see Saul on here today. Maybe someone else uh, could volunteer because I am not a photo expert. I have real problems with it. In fact, I have questions about it. 
Anybody, Anybody else uh, know anything about photos? I don't know anything about it, but I will say that I thought that was an excellent presentation. Stan. Um, I've been using uh, Photoshop elements for years. And uh, actually, my profession was motion pictures and photography. But um, I, when I moved over to Google Photos, the one thing I missed that Photoshop elements had was a very good file management system where you could see all of the files that you had by date and by, by location even and various other things. So that was going to be my one question about it. But it was an excellent presentation and it had a lot of tools, uh, obviously for, fo for photo adjustment that uh, Photoshop Elements had some of, most of many of those tools, I would say, and Photoshop uh, Professional would probably have almost everything that was there, but uh, it looked like very good. My only question would be how you're able to find the photos that you want to work with, uh, which obviously I, I don't think anybody here has an answer for that. I well, I think that I would I say uh, go to uh, Google Images. Uh, that that yeah. uh, Google Images is not a photo editor. No, but you said just to find the images you want. Yeah, but I want it integrated into the photo management, the photo adjustment fo uh, program, like Photoshop Elements. The file manager was built into Photoshop Elements. So when you're in the Elements, you have a way to find the photographs that you want to work with. Before I, before I uh, get on to, I see hands up and I gather those, those hands are all for discussion of this program that was just on there. And I want to point out something to everyone who's here he kept using this, but I'm not sure everybody knows this. Uh, when you have just done something on your computer that you, your, your brain is saying, damn, why did I do that? That's, I don't want to do that. I want to undo that. Control Z. Z. Have the control key and type Z once, and it undoes the last thing you did on your, in that program the one you're currently using. Type it again, hold the control key down and type C again, and it goes back one more to something else you did. And you can keep undoing <coughs> for quite some time. And it, okay. learning that and having it, having it ready can save your neck when you're doing things on your computer that you wish you hadn't done. Barbara. Yes, uh, I found that presentation absolutely fascinating. I have not done any sort of experimenting with unknown computer graphs and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm wondering how badly like your old photographs before we used uh, cameras that we could connect to our computer, the old ones that we have to scan. Um, I guess there's a lot more work involved in kind of enhancing those photos, you know, before you can make any kind of adjustments. But I certainly am going to plan on, on checking it out because I, as I said, I think that's going to be my my next project for the next several years. And I'm, I'm glad that I was able to watch it. Okay, thank you. I have a look. If, I may, if I may answer that question, uh, photographs, physical photographs that you have in a book or in a box can be scanned and and uh, and they you know that's the only way to get uh, the photograph unless you have the original yeah. negatives then you would scan the negatives but um, scanning the photograph is the only way to get them into your computer yeah i noticed the a lot of the really old photographs that i have are have kind of a, a red um image now it's not an image but an a, an a red background or it's everything's 
seem to have turned kind of an orangey red on them. So I guess there'd be a lot of major work. <laughs> that's that's just what happens before they go completely blank. Yeah. Uh, it's just aging. It's, you mentioned really old, and the really old photographs fade. Yeah. And and they also turn color before they fade. So that's just the nature of old photographs. I would like to add something to that before we go on to the next hand and question. I'm sorry, but you can also take a picture of your old photograph with a camera or with your phone, and that will automatically digitize it, and then you can use that particular photo that you've just taken. Oh, that's an idea. Good. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we'll go next. Uh, Pat, Pat's up next. Oh, oh, I thought Will was. No, oh, you, you are. are. Oh, okay. Well, I just um, had, uh, well, a couple of comments. Um, I took a class years ago with, and I thought I was in another class, another photo class, and I ended up in Photoshop. And uh, it took hours to do one photo. So you have to plan in a lot of time. And then, um, so I got out of that class. I didn't, that wasn't what I wanted. But I wanted to mention about finding a photo because my uh, cousin, uh, we took a group photo when I was back in Michigan. And, but my one cousin had to leave early. So when we took the group, she wasn't there. So my other cousin photoshopped her in. And so when everybody wanted me to, you know, uh, you know, send them a copy, I couldn't find that photo in my pictures. And the way I finally found it, it was in where the oldest photo was, which was the picture that she shopped in, which was like about four or five years earlier. So it took me, I don't know how long to find that. So if anybody's looking for a photo, um, that's what you, what, that's what I found. And then regarding Barb's, I don't know if she'd want to do this or not, but um, you know, I took all my photos, but they were in fairly good shape. And this was back to a service. So I think it was gas lamp photo service, which doesn't exist anymore. And I took a shoebox full and they scanned in all my uh, pictures and then gave me a CD or a DVD, something like that. This was years ago. But if you want to do that now, Georgia's, which is down in like the Hillcrest area, does that. If anybody wants to do that. It's easier than, you know, scanning in hundreds of photos. But if you have to adjust them, that might not work. Might not work. Okay, thanks, Pat. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. There, Will. Yeah, there are several services that will do that for you. You just give them a box load of photos and they will uh, digitize them and send it back on a flash drive or something. And it's a little expensive, but uh, it depends on how much time you want to take doing it yourself. And you can buy a scanner that will uh, do it fairly inexpensively. In fact, I think I got a couple of them if anybody wants one. Um, my question was, the only thing I'm really interested in, and I've been trying to find some program that does it easily, I'm sure GIMP would be like a Band-Aid on a shark bite, but uh, I'd be able to add a red circle and a red arrow to point out certain things on a photograph. And I suppose uh, even Google Photos would do that. Uh, I have Irfan View, which is another pretty powerful program to do it. And even uh, Google Photos, did I say that? And there's another comes with Windows. It's called, uh, yes, do. Does paint do layers? Does anybody know? That's probably what you need to do is uh, you can download a, as a transparent uh, PNG file and probably same thing for an arrow. Do and uh, I just need to do it. Uh, Picasso used to do this sort of thing. Plus there's a lot of auto fix. There's a lot of auto fix uh, programs too that our programs that will just uh, click on the photo and say auto fix it and it'll show you, you know, half a dozen different variations of what they've done to fix it. So uh, that makes life easy. 
Uh, interesting in colorization, I haven't looked, but it seemed to me there probably are some programs on there for doing colorization of photos of old black and whites, uh, make it very easy. It's interesting that they have colorized uh, movie film, old movie film that's black and white and colorize that. And I suppose they have some very fancy software that does that because obviously you have to colorize every frame of the uh, movie photo and that really gets complex, I suppose. But they, I expect the computer makes it easy. That's all I have, thanks. Next up is Fran. So I want to reiterate Pat's sentiment that this is really difficult, especially if you are very left brain and not right brain, because you need a sense of like, where do the shadows go? My husband, who I met because he was a painter when I bought his painting, he does this great. But for me, it would be so time consuming. It's lovely to have, but let's be realistic. And you got to analyze if you have that artistic talent to understand those little bits. Number two, I want to say now we know how all the misinformation and celebrity photos get on the internet. <laughs> they all get cropped and photoshopped. So that was a good lesson. And uh, the final thing, I guess this is uh, uh, Will's comment also, is that there are a number of programs, there's even one called on Google, there's a, a thing, but you, you, can, you can select, you know, make it like a Picasso or make it like old tint, and it will automatically do all the rendering for you. And that, you know, for us non-artists, <laughs> That's a really good choice, uh, but there's and there's a lot of them out there and they're completely free. And also, um, a lot of the programs just say, you know, fix, you know, and you click it and it lightens it up or whatever. So and thank you, Pat, for reminding me about the service, because I have boxfuls of stuff I got to do, even though I originally did a bunch of stuff. And that just gave me a lot of free time. <laughs> Is that it, Fran? OK, Dan. You're muted. Just like to say the library offers a lot of those services if you have some, just a few photos you want to uh, copy. And also, uh, Seniors Computer Group used to have a scanner for slides. I don't know whatever happened to that or if it's still available or not. Anybody know anything about that? I don't know anything about that, but if we have something, it's probably in the, one of the, the storage rooms at uh, Wesley Palms, which we are going to get into one of these days, but I don't know when one of these days is. <laughs> okay. That's all I had to say about that subject. Okay, thanks, Dan. I have a couple of items. If anyone wants to watch this thing again, it is on our website under events. When we have a presentation like this that is available somewhere on YouTube or on some somewhat someplace on the internet, I always put it I put that on the on our website. So that's the first thing. And the other thing I wanted to say was that a long time ago, I think it was Tom Sprague uh, told us that the La Jolla Library, specifically the La Jolla Library, not any library, has some very, very good uh, equipment to digitize things. Uh, pictures, yes, even movies, uh, eight millimeter movies, 16 millimeter movies. And if you call them up and say, I want to do this, on what day would someone be there to help me? I think the La Jolla Library uh, would be a great place to go and, and uh, try some of this. Do you have to have a La Jolla address or anything? No, no, anybody, 
anybody with a library card can go to the La Jolla Library and use it. Are you sure it's the La Jolla Library and not the other private library that has all kinds of artsy and rentals? I, La Jolla Library. I've been there, done that. La Jolla Library. <laughs> Thanks, Stan. You're up. Yeah, um, let me mention um, about the library first. Uh, I took a manual, a printed manual over there. They have a machine that you just stick the manual into it, press the go button, paste it, and they gave. I put it on a flash drive and everything for free. It was great. Stanley, yeah, um, as I mentioned briefly, I want to remind you that Google Photos has all the tools that I decided that I need to do my casual improvement of my photographs. And they're nowadays all done by my phone. Um, and I think any photograph can be improved first by cropping and they have very good tools for cropping. And the, then they have uh, a few tools for uh, uh, optimizing uh, improving contrast, one thing or another. There's nothing there like like he like our presentation was doing, but for most of us, the tools available in Google Photos is great. And again, I get back to file management because you could look for photographs by date. Uh, they have facial recognition. You place pictures in albums. You could group them together in a group of photos to tell a story. So I encourage you to look into uh, Google Photos for our present day reliance on uh, smartphone uh, photographs and managing those. Um, that's all that comes to mind right now. Thank you. I have something I want to show everybody. I wish I had practice this ahead of time so but uh let me take a whack at it i want to talk about google search by images so i'm going to come back here and share one of my screens anywhere and oh come on Let's get rid of this, hide that. There we go. Now, if I go to a new, are you seeing this now? You seeing my Google page? Somebody say yes, no, or maybe? Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. If you go, if you put up a new image in with a Google search place here, and then you come up here to the upper right and click images, you then shift your search so it can shift by images. And you can search for things. You can type something in like, uh, let me try this. If I now, nope. Well, let's try this. Yeah. See, I, sir, I typed in something I knew had a lot of photos. It's, it's the old vacation rental that I used to run on Kauai, which, which I don't run anymore. So if you type something in that you, you are looking for, you will actually get the photos. And then you can take any one of them and copy it or save it or whatever. These are all pictures of even me. <laughs> and uh, you can also search by images. If you click here and upload an image from your computer, like I'm uploading a file. Here we go. I've uploaded that. No, 
Sorry, I can't do what I wanted to do, but you can upload. I guess I did right here. I uploaded here. And then if I search by that, that's a picture of the wall of my dining room here in my house. Well, at any rate, you can search by image using Google if you click images when you first start the Google search page. Enough yammer. Let me get rid of my sharing. Okay. Who's got their hand up? Will. You're muted. Probably, probably everybody except me knew that you uh, can take the photos from your cell phone and automatically have them go to Google Photos on your computer. Um, I can't tell you the exact sequence, but I think it's just share and then put in your uh, email address. But that makes it all the photos that are on your cell phone and put them directly into your computer Google Photos. I, as I say, uh, I'm the last one to learn that. Stanley, you got a comment? They are on your phone. If you have Google Photos on your phone, smartphone, under your email account, and you open up your email account in Google and go to the icon for Google Photos, the pictures that are in your phone are on your computer. That's what I'm saying is Google Photos is your friend, so to speak. And thank you, Hank, for reminding me that search on images because I have um, birds in the neighborhood and I wonder what kind of bird that is. And I'm sure that uh, Google Photos, if I got a close enough picture of a bird in a tree, the Google Photos would show me pictures and identify it. Thank you. <laughs> I did it with a wild looking vine in my backyard in Hawaii that doesn't grow many places, but Google found what, what it was. Did you use the Google Photos or Google Lens? Because you can use Google Lens. No, no, excuse me. Google search when you click images. It's not Google Photos that I was just demonstrating. It's Google search. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. Mr. Malloy. To add to what Mr. Stanley was talking about, um, yes, on your cell phone, if you install the Google Photos program and enable it to synchronize the, the photos, it actually moves the photos off of your phone to Google. When you sign in through your Google Chrome program to your email account and add the same one as you're using on the phone, then you can go to the photos program and see all your pictures there. If you want to have them in your computer, also, you need to download them. They don't automatically download to your computer. It's an extra step, but Google is then trying to keep a copy of all of those photos at their site. Uh, Ross, that, I, I found that it did automatically bring them to my computer. Um, you can see them on your computer through your browser. But if you want to edit it, if you want to email it, then you need to copy it out of photos as such, download it into your computer, and then you can manipulate it. Dan. Yeah, th uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, I was unclear. Uh, I typically, every month or so, download my current list of uh, Google Chrome, uh, Google Photos to my hard drive. And then I sort of consider that as an archive, it's sort of reverse archive because they're on my computer. And if I edit photos in Google Chrome, they are not edited on my files that I have on my computer. So I misspoke when I said they're on your computer. The Google Photos are available on your computer. Okay. Dan? 
Yes. Last week I asked about ID me. And I was tangled up with ID me for the last three weeks or so. Uh, my first concern was ID.me and the ME domain. ME domain is uh, Mon Monterego, but they're selling access to their domain. So I guess IDME is a legitimate site because I was referred to it by the VA and also was referred to it by the IRS when I tried to get in the IRS site. I did finally manage to get signed up with IDE. I had a very difficult time, like I say, mainly I guess because all my computers are out of date. But it, it, the site is terrible. It doesn't explain anything at the beginning. It just throws you in there and says, okay, show us your identity. I tried showing them my passport by scanning it in with a Linux program that was a bad program, and they wouldn't accept that. So I finally scanned it with the scanner and, and the scanner program, which is a Hewlett Packard program and an old, very old version of Linux. I'm a very old version of Windows, so I could get a a good picture of my passport and also my real ID, which they wanted the front and also the back, which they neglected to say up front. I have a new laptop over here. I want to try and, it. No. And uh, I bought all that stuff and eventually got the documents that they required and called, I didn't call them, I tried to contact them on the phone. The phone wouldn't talk to them because it wouldn't transmit pictures. So I had to set up a computer with a camera on it to get to them and show them my passport and front and back of my real ID on the computer camera. And I finally got approved by ID, and now I can go to my VA site. I, so, I don't understand why you are telling us all this. I'm, well, I'm, not, I'm not throwing rocks at you. I'm just trying to understand why, why we are learning this. I'm telling you this. It has to do with scanning pictures to begin with. And... Also, if you want to go to government sites now, they require IDE. And my concern was I'm giving all this information to a site which has a Montrego domain name, is number one. But I was referred to that by the IRS and the VA, so I guess I had to do it. So now I have a site or uh, an identity on IDME, which we're getting more and more like China. We find more and more information. Ross, do you know what he's talking about, about having to have me that's approved by the IRS? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that, that there's more and more security required to go to various websites um where the website what country it's in i think was dan's first concern um i don't recognize that ending but if you go to what is my ip address you can put in the name of a website or an ip address and then find out actually where it is um we're starting to limit our customers from being able to go to websites outside the continental United States. 
um, the thought was that that might be safer. I'm not sure about it, but that's that's what we're doing at this point. And I think Dan was trying to do the same thing just to make sure that he knew where his information was going. Okay. The Montrego is selling their websites, I guess. To, I, I don't know why this, this site has a site in Montrego. I don't know. Montrego? Understand. Where where is that? It's a country. Montrego. Montenegro? That's, yes. That's what ME, the domain ME goes to. But Montrego, I guess, had no use for all these websites. So they're selling them to people well, Hank, in the United States. And I I, Hank, as I understand, um, you want to get a real ID because if you're going to IRS site or social security site, those now are requiring, one of the requirements is that you have a real ID. And I think that's what Dan was talking about was how to, how to get a real ID. Is that right, Dan? No, I have real ID, but you can't get on a website where real ID is a card. No, real ID is a uh, computer connection uh, code or whatever you have to do to put it in. At least that's what I had to do. When I went on to an IRS site, they said they're putting your real ID. The IRS site tells me you have to have a register to register with ID.me. ID.me. Yeah, that's Dan, yeah. this is the the website is ID dot Mike Edwards M E. That is correct. ID dot M E. Yes, okay. I, I misspoke. It's a See, I, I, I I spent thirty one years in the Navy, and I have a lot of dealings online with government entities and nobody has ever asked me for anything having to do with the id.me have you tried to go to your va site do you have a va my my healthy vet is the va site yeah i get that site no i i've not dealt with the va i dealt i deal with the, the place called dfas D, defense finance which is my retirement money comes from. Have you tried to check the status of your income tax? With my the status? IRS site? Yes, I, I've checked the status of my income tax refund about a week for the past month until I finally got it. And I did not have to register anywhere. I just went to the, the website that says here's where you check the status of your refund okay ask not, Mary, i think no, Miriam has a hand up and miriam is familiar with that ide side also right i i needed it for the irs i wanted to pay my tax due on the irs website and in order to get through all of that i had to go through the id.me uh business and i ended up with an interview with a woman a, a zoom session where she i held up my passport and i held up my uh driver's license and she said yep that's you and uh said it was okay and then the next time i logged in uh to the irs i had an id.me uh user id and password and i got in and everything's all done but it was it was not well done i mean it, it was really hard to get it all finished because I tried to do it online without a person, the, the interview. And the uh, I gave up finally and said, I'd sign up for an interview. And as I recall, it told me how much time was it was going to take before the interviewer got back to me. And I think it was fairly correct. Uh, but it was, it was at least an hour. Uh, it wasn't a day and a half, which is what I was, what I feared, but uh, it's, I got it all done, but it was not fun. That's my point. Yeah. 
Okay, let's move on. Fran's been waiting for a long time. Fran? So I'm back to um, the Google pictures. I've been using that for a while because um, if you have a Mac now, they have limited space to save it. And, you, and your options are save everything or save nothing in, in the cloud. So by having stuff go to Google, I don't have to buy an iCloud more iCloud storage. It's also good if you're having a family reunion or something like that and you can um, share, make albums and share them with everybody who is at the party. And the third thing, <clears throat> talked about downloading to your computer. I, you can actually export your entire um, pictures, which can be a lot of them. And uh, it takes about a day and they create this export file and then you can save it to a thumb drive mm -hmm. and put it wherever you want or save it wherever you want. So that's my two bits. Okay, well, you still want, have something to say? Um, no, I got my answer. Thank you. Okay, I th have we done Q and A or I see nodding heads. Anyone have anything else they want to bring up as a general Q and A? It doesn't have anything to do with ID or or uh, GIMP or anything else we've discussed. Just plain new Q and A. Uh, I, I want to thank Dan for bringing that up because uh, I have not come across it. I'm glad to know that it's legal. I'm glad to know that ME is Montenegro as a domain. And uh, that was very informative side uh, sideline. Thank you. It's, where is Montenegro? What, what is it? It's, it's uh, about, uh, across the Adriatic Sea from the heel of Italy. Oh, OK. I, I have a hard time believing that ID.me is really being run out of Montenegro. I, I've, I've just gone there and looked at the website and uh, I'm gonna do some more investigating. Well, ME is also Maine. Most people don't know that. <laughs> yeah. I, before we leave, I just- uh, But to that's not a domain name. That's not a domain extension. Maine is the um, abbreviation for Maine. As a domain name, the thing that follows the period in a, um, a URL, it's a domain. Okay. okay. Evidently, they are selling sites. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, uh, before we leave, I just wanted to say I've been fascinated a bit, and so I finally filed my taxes. And I use TurboTax. Yeah. With that, you can do uh, e-filing, and it made it very, very easy. So I kind of use that. Yeah, me too. Anybody else uses TurboTax? It's a great program. Do other yeah. people find that Will's uh, audio is coming through kind of blurred, or is it just? No. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Will you? And this yeah. happens almost every time that you you speak here on on weekends. Can you work on that some way to change your mic or change something? No, the well, internet, most of us have a hard time understanding you. I, it's my internet, and I don't know why it's so bad. Yeah, I'm trying to get a cable. I, I'm getting like thirty megabit. You need a wire from your computer to your modem. Wish I had one. <laughs> I thought you that's the solution, it. Will. If you need to have better audio and better video, that's what you need to have or move your location. Um, it's I work on this all the time. People say, I'm, but I want to be able to. I'm going, I understand what you're telling me you want to, but this is the solution. Yeah. And, and we need you to do that, Will, because we value the stuff that you have to say, and we can't hear it. Uh, I, I want to add that um, I put in that AC link 
uh, between my uh, router and my TV, and it works flawlessly. It's going through the household wiring. Uh, Saul so run it out so it's on the same circuit. We establish it's on the same circuit, and uh, it works flawlessly. Somebody has some background noise coming through on all of us. I don't yeah, know. I think it's Dan. It I seems like Dan comes up. I'm getting thirty megabits, so I don't. I'm getting thirty megabits, so I don't understand the problem. Uh, but uh, Hank has the same problem. He's getting very, very fast uh, internet speed, and uh, he gets kicked off. You that's, seem to be better when issue. you're closer to your computer. Dan, I mean, well, and my microphone hangs over my neck. Oh. <laughs> Might help if you bought a lapel mic and used that, plugged it in. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, it's, I think we we are beating horses that are. I think we're done. <laughs> not well. Yeah. I'm done for this week. I am vastly in need of someone to make a presentation on some subject because you are getting right now you are stuck with the the uh, the various webinars that I'm getting from AppSug and they are all almost an hour long and that's Ooh. pretty long for our meetings I don't want to do that all the time who said something? Uh, I, I, would, I, I would like to say that uh, a full meeting of Q&A uh, would, wouldn't hurt us once a month, uh, aside from the board meeting. I think we could uh, have another meeting each month that is strictly q and I don't think we need a... a uh, a presentation each week. Each week. Okay. I'll uh, I'll take that into account in my programming. Programming. Thank you all for attention. It is good to see we had. Uh, I think we had thirteen or fourteen people here at the max. And I'll see you all next week. Adios. Yeah. Enjoy your